Let's see if it works. Oh, it works now. Okay. All right. I want to show you about uh, Dragon Four. I'm gonna have you do this over the next like couple days and whatnot. So in the aquariums, we've got colonies of coral that are growing, and when the coral colonies get big, they can end up running into each other and overgrowing each other and whatnot. But uh, what we do is when the colonies get big, like this is just part of one colony of a purple coral that's down in the bottom of the big 550 gallon tank. And this only represents maybe like 10% of that colony. Is uh, if we take that piece and um, cut it up, break it up into small pieces, and then offer it for sale uh, or give it to other schools and whatnot. This is actually a bright purple color, but it looks kind of like brownish, almost kind of black because I contrast isn't so great. But uh, one thing that happens, you'll see on this piece, there's like this purpley color here, but then there's this part here that's kind of brownish. This part has been shaded because how this coral grows, it grows out in big flat plates. And here I'll break it so you can see what happens. These uh, brown parts here that are like this is where another piece has grown over top of it. And as a result of one piece growing over the top of the other one, it ends up shading the one underneath. So this stuff, all this part right here, this used to be alive, but now it's dead because it's been covered up and no light got to it. So part of what we try to do is make it so that the coral can live as long as possible. And uh, all this structure, you can see how thick it is here on the camera. All this big, thick, white structure, that's all calcium. This animal that's living in polyps on this surface has built this structure. And out here at the base, it's, you know, three-eighths of an inch thick or so. It's, it's pretty thick. As time goes on, Coral continues to grow, it'll grow further in this direction toward the margin. This is the new growth margin, and it'll also continue to get thicker. So it's actually the thinnest out of the edge, it's thicker toward the, the middle, because the coral's been living here longer and less time here. And uh, this structure here has thousands of individual animals all living together. Every little tiny dot on there is like a separate animal. Anyway, this stuff, uh, you can break it by hand. In fact, out at the edge, it's kind of like almost like potato chip. You just give it a little twist and the pieces will break up. And that natural breaking is called fragmenting, or we just say fragment. And uh, in nature, whenever there's a storm that comes by, you get heavy waves, it'll smash the coral up, or it could be, you know, someone hits it, either a person or a fish or something like that. So we break them into these little pieces that are about that size. And then, uh, offer them for sale. But in order to sell them, they have to kind of stay organized and have a good way for them to grow. Whenever they're single little pieces like that, they're in the tanks, they tend to get blown around, they can get flipped over and whatnot. So uh, what we do to organize them is a couple different things. The major thing we do is mount it onto these things called frag plugs. And the frag plugs are little ceramic discs that have a little thing that sticks down the bottom. These serve a few different purposes. The way the process actually goes is we take the coral and glue it onto that plug. So it's glued right on there. We use super glue, stick it right on. There. But the thing about the plug is that plug with the little thing on the bottom allows us to organize it. This stuff that's in the bottom of the tray here is called egg crate. An egg crate is the fuser panel that's used for fluorescent lights. But um, it's just the right, what's going on? Yeah, it's just the right size so that these pins will fit down into the egg crate. And then uh, we can keep it kind of organized and lined up and whatnot. And then uh, also for transport, because to transport this stuff for sale, you got to transport it in the cooler. You can't just throw all your coral and the cooler together. It all gets beat around and it'll get smashed up. So these trays fit down into the coolers and the plugs stay in the little rack and then they won't move around and stay organized. But then the other purpose of the plug is when people have a rock in their aquariums, this is like reef rock that's common uh, in aquariums. It has a very large surface area for lots of bacteria to live in. And then uh, it's made of limestone, which increases the calcium concentration, makes the alkalinity good in the aquarium. It's really porous, has all these holes in it. 
So when people buy the piece of coral and they want to put it in their aquarium, they don't want to lose it in the aquarium. They want to put it somewhere particular. This little pin allows them to like take the coral and like slide it into a hole. And then your piece of coral is on that plug and it won't move in the aquarium. So then uh, it'll end up growing from there. All of the pieces of coral that we have in all of our tanks all started out as little fragments like this. All started out as fragments. That's how I get them. Trade for them, buy them, people donate them, whatever. And over time, they just keep growing. So a little piece like this in the right condition can end up making a colony that's, you know, three feet across, maybe in four or five years. It takes time. You got to be real patient. It's not fast growing. But then uh, what we use for the adhesive is super glue. Let me show you how the box goes. So this is the, the brand I buy, Bob Smith International. And inside here, there's super glue, but it's super, super thick gel super glue. You can buy super glue of different thicknesses. Um, most super glue is really, really super runny. The real runny super glue lets you put together things that are really flat that are really flush up against each other. Like if you break a mug, you want to put the handle back on the mug. The place where the mug and the handle met up, there's a, the gap is very tiny. You put them right up against each other. So you actually want to use real thin super glue. And real thin super glue saps really fast. This is really super thick super glue. Uh, it's like toothpaste in consistency. It takes a long time to cure. So I'll show you how to use these. Uh, the, super, the tube of super glue is sealed on the end of the metal. And then this is the cap that's also the dispenser. And how the cap and dispenser works is when you screw this cap on, it punctures the metal on the end. So here you see if I unscrew it, now the, I don't know, the cap is punctured and the glue can come out. Anyway, when this is screwed on, then the bottom part, if you hold that, you can unscrew the lid and now you can like squeeze it out. And what's really important is not to like, there's two kinds of there's two kinds of people with toothpaste. There's the people with toothpaste who are the squeezers like this, and then there's the people who are the rollers up. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to be a squeezer. I don't care what you do with your toothpaste. Don't be a squeezer with the super glue. Because if you're a squeezer with the super glue, these uh, containers are metal, and if you squeeze it, the side tends to like crack open, especially if you squeeze it a couple different times, and then the super glue comes out the side and it's done. These are like six dollars a tube. And you can get a little ways into it and have it get all messed up. So you want to work from the bottom. And the bottom already is crimped. And you can roll it up from the bottom. So if you dispense it, you like roll it from the bottom. These are ones that people had like squeezed. And that's not OK. So I've been trying to like you know, get them going back to the bottom. And the thing about the super glue is the box comes with two dispenser tips. I was already on there for good. So if one gets all clogged up, you can just replace the tip and it'll like continue to come out. Yeah, that one's clogged too. So that makes sense. Yeah, so this one unscrews and then you can put another end on it. Now it'll come out as long as it's still okay. Yep, there, now it's coming out. So the way it goes is uh, there's living tissue and it's always like kind of colored. And then there's dead tissue, which is the bottom side. The bottom side's totally dead. And all you gotta do is take like a dab of super glue, put it on there, get your frag plug. And what's important is the frag plug already be wet because what actually makes super glue pure is water. So whenever you use super glue, it's actually water vapor in the air that cures the super glue. You might cure super glue by like also blowing on it, but your blowing on it doesn't cause it to evaporate a solvent instead of blowing on it the moisture from your air from your breath will help it cure so the good thing about the super glue is right now see it's not on there real good it, it falls right back off but because these are going to be placed in the water whenever you put the thing in water the water itself will help it cure now see it's on there so the water itself oops like it takes a few moments Uh, the water itself will help the super glue here. So a lot of times temporarily you can have it in here and set it down like that until it's fairly well cured and then you can flip it back over. The goal usually is to cover the plug because
because what you don't want to do is have it so that whenever you offer it for sale, people see the plug underneath. Instead, you just want it to be like kind of covered up. This is a bright purple color, but it looks kind of brown on these lights, but in the aquarium lights, it's a nice bright purple. This is called a uh, great Montipora capricornis. The Montipora capricornis is the genus and species name. And then it comes in different colors and they call this color variety great, which is like purple. And at a retail store or an online store, you could expect to pay 30 bucks for that. And I'll offer that for sale for 10, which is like really cheap. So this colony here, you know, retail is hundreds of dollars worth of coral and just that one little colony. And I mean, those prices, I'm not like bragging is like what that comes out to be, but we spend a lot of money running this system every year. So we also have to generate a lot of money. Because I'm about to order some salt for the next year and a half. It's going to be about 4,000 bucks. So I got to sell, you know, about 400 of these pieces just to be able to buy enough salt to make us for like the next year or so. So in this hobby, it, it's more of a hobby. And then this is all aquaculture. So this coral doesn't come from the ocean because people criticize the aquarium trade in that, you know, we take living coral out of the ocean, which honestly is not good for the reefs. But if you grow it in uh, captivity in a sustainable way and then offer it for sale, all of this coral came from, you know, just doing it here. I didn't have to go to the ocean and take the pieces out and cut them up. There's people in our trade, they do what, I don't know, I don't want to be real critical of it. They call it chop shopping. Just the same as somebody would steal a car and chop it up to sell the pieces. Uh, people go out in the ocean, get big colonies, cut them up and sell it. And they make a lot of money doing it. And, you know, as long as it's done legally, it's on up and up. But it's not as good of a practice as, um, you know, getting it from the ocean originally sometime, growing captivity. These individual pieces of coral that were grown from the crags, uh, some of them, this great Monty, Monty cat, called Monty cat, I've had it since about 2005 in different tanks grown different ways. So I've never gotten any since, you know, about 16 years or so like that. Anyway, just get a bunch of super glue on there, throw, throw the uh, frag on there, you let it cure, and then that's how it goes. People can tell if it has been fragged recently or not, because uh, as soon as you mount this at the edge where it was cut, it's still like white and uh, freshly cut. You can see and tell that. But in the next month or so, the uh, polyps will grow down over along the side and make it so it's purple all along the side. And that's better because when the colony is cut like that, it's also susceptible to dying, it's susceptible to disease, and it's kind of not as good. So there's a big sale that I'm going to at the end of June and over the next couple of weeks and whatnot, I got to get everything all cut up basically within. So it start the sales on June 28th. And the last time I can reasonably cut stuff up for sale will be about June 21st. So there's about a week for it to cure and be okay. The new tank in the hallway is a coral fragment tank. And that has pieces of coral that are examples of, you know, how the process goes and whatnot. And in typical years in the oceanography class or when we have the aquarium science class, we work in the fish room a lot, but there's not sufficient space in there to socially distance. In other words, you can't walk by somebody you got to almost touch them you're up, you're up against them so we haven't used the fish room that so anyway that's a kind of a plating coral that's one kind of coral there's other types of, of coral uh this type here is a branching coral and this happens to be what's called a bird's nest coral because it kind of looks like if a bird were to take a bunch of twigs and put them together in a nest and this just looks brown up here but the base of the coral is like a peach color, and then the tips are bright green under the blue lights. So when you're out working ambient light like this, it doesn't look like much. 
frankly, this coral out in the ocean just looks brown. But under the blue lights, because you notice we use a lot of blue lights, it brings out a lot of the fluorescence that's in the coral colony itself. And uh, here, what we're trying to do is offer pieces that are like a compromise between size and price, sort of. Uh, if I were to offer this whole piece for sale, I might ask $50, but I can break this up into probably seven pieces that I could get 10 bucks a piece for. So it's like you sell one for 50, or you break it up into seven for 10 each, and you make more money seven for 10 each. So it kind of comes down to like, who are your customers going to be? Are you going to have a whole bunch of customers looking for $50 pieces? Uh, and it's just one $50 piece to sell, which is easy, or you take the time to break it up into smaller pieces and offer the smaller pieces to more clients. And at the sales, it's kind of like a craft fair. People walk around, they look in your tanks, they see what you got, and then they kind of, you know, buy what they see, ask you questions. So, like, this is a typical size piece they might try to end up breaking it into. And it's a little trickier with pieces that are uh, branching because there's a lot less surface area. So, what you have to do is plan a little bit, like, how is the piece of coral going to sit on the plug? The one that you picked throughout, you must have put two quid in front of There's nothing around it that's broken. Okay. It broke the disc or broke yep. the plastic? Broke the disc, but so oh, I can't. It won't snap? Nope. Oh, that's weird. So, so they broke one and stole two. Hmm. Or lost two. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, they're like heat packs. Yep. I know. They're ghetto sophomores. Who do they think they are? They're like this overgrown, overgrown freshman. So, anyway, you kind of got to plan a way that they can attach. And it looks like that can be sort of okay and it just sort of sticks up. And then what you got to do is figure out like where is the plug going to touch the frag and then put the glue on the frag in the place where the plug is going to touch. So here I'm kind of looking and I see it looks like it's going to touch here, it's going to touch over there, it's going to touch over there. So I can pull the plug away and then put some glue where it looked like the plug was going to touch. And then when I put the plug into place, then the glue will cure between the plug and the, and the coral. And actually just dipping it in the water a couple times helps to activate the, uh, the glue. And then it's pretty much going to be on there. So now it's on there. And then that's like an okay piece and you're like 10 bucks. People will buy it. It's a uh, peach with green tip, bird's nest coral. And so we try to offer a bunch of different kinds. We have hundreds of different types of coral. Other things that we've got, in some of the tanks, there's some uh, photophilic sponge. This is actually like a purple sponge, and it feels just like rubber. It's totally like, you didn't know this was a live sponge. You'd think it's just like a piece of like really flexible rubber. It's totally what it feels like. Most sponge doesn't like light, but this, a uh, sponge you say is photophilic, it likes light, and you can glue it on the surfaces too. And besides the frag plugs, which have the pins on the bottom, there's also these things it's called frag discs. So really it's just like a, a flat piece of ceramic. And that flat ceramic can also be suitable because if someone is not gonna put the thing into a rock but set it on the bottom of the aquarium, the little disc is a good thing to set on the bottom. And it turns out that the super glue will stick to the sponge. Not all sponge is yellow, and it's not all moon bob. And that'll stick on it. And that's that. And this photophilic sponge, same deal, like 10 bucks, whatever. But the price, they do work at the Krusty Krab. That's right. They're making those Krabby Patties. There's like a decent piece. So. That's like another little piece, maybe 10 bucks. This one's, there's a couple on here. Like this is okay. That's kind of big, but so 
maybe a little bit smaller. And besides snapping it with your fingers, you can also use bone cutters, which are like little uh, like diagonal pliers that are used, well, to cut bone if you're into like breaking bones up, like in the movie Saw. This? Yeah. Yep. So the, the coral itself is living on the surface, but all the time it's growing more structured. Here at the new growth tips, the growth tips at the end are white. That's where the new coral is growing up out. So the tips are where the coral structure is the thinnest, but down at the base, it's even thicker because the longer the coral lives, the thicker it makes the base. This bird's nest coral can end up to be a pretty big colony in the middle of the back of the 550 gallon tank. The colonies, um, it's about two foot, about a foot and a half by two foot by two foot tall. It's a pretty big chunk. Anyway, that fell off. So you gotta kind of like, a lot of times you gotta re glue them. So, like the day after you do it the first time, you go back through and find the pieces that didn't stick right. You gotta kind of like, sort of redo it. Anyway, so just in that little bit of time, uh, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 14, 15. There's 18 pieces that I already cut up. There's another like 20 worth there, or probably about 25. So there's like 250 bucks worth of coral just from that array, which is, which is all right. So besides stony coral, that's called stony coral, it builds a rough structure. There's also soft coral. And soft coral is a type of coral that builds no, builds no structure at all. This is a green, uh, it's actually really bright green, like a neon green uh, coral called a, um, well, it's a green leather coral. And the deal with this is you can't really super glue it down because it's all flesh and the flesh will come off or break off. So fragging it has always been a challenge. I need to get a different kind of plug. So a guy turned me on to a trick. So the way the soft coral goes, you can just cut it with scissors and it kind of feels like leather. And that's why I call it leather coral. And uh, I had a pair of four scissors. So because people grow that kind of coral usually on the bottom of the tank growing up, it's usually suitable to use like a frag disc like this. And the couple different ways that people have tried and have tried over the over the years is to take the coral and wherever you want to frag it, you just take the scissors and you cut it. So now see I've got like two separate pieces here, that piece and this piece. And the smaller one, if I want to mount that, the couple different things people try to do is to take like super glue. And super glue it on, except the super glue doesn't really stick. Another thing you can try to do is take a rubber band, rubber band it on. But it turns out that the coral doesn't like the pressure from the rubber band. So if you take and rubber band it onto a flat plug like this, what happens is the coral will actually cut itself. It'll cleave itself right there. It'll actually break into two pieces, and those two pieces will go and float away. So they've left the thing you want them to stay on. Another thing that people do sometimes is take a fishing line and like a needle and kind of like thread the needle of fishing line, put it through the body of the coral, and then kind of tie that on. And that works okay, but it's kind of labor intensive and takes a while to do. And still the coral will leave itself or leave that space. Uh, another thing people do is take what they call wedding veil. 
wedding veil is just like a, a fine mesh that you can actually literally use as a wedding veil and put the plug inside a little container with wedding veil and then hope the coral will stick to it. And that's also very labor intensive. So there's this dude who I met at a show where I was selling some of it. And he turned me on to this idea of making plugs that have a hole in them. So you see, this has like a hole, like a depression inside. And he was like, here's what you do. You take sand and you take a Portland cement and you mix it up. And you make like your own little cement, your own little concrete. And then you pour that concrete into a Dixie cup. So these Dixie cups are actually where these were made. So what I do is I pour some cement down in the bottom of the Dixie cup, let the cement kind of set up a little bit, and take your finger and kind of like move it around in the middle and make a depression. So there's like a little hole down in the middle of the uh, plug. And the reason why you have the hole down in the plug like that is then when you take your coral, I lost my piece, here it goes. You can put part of the coral down in there. So the coral, the base of the coral is sitting down in the hole. And then when you put the rubber band on it, the rubber band will hold the coral in place, but doesn't squeeze it. It doesn't put a lot of pressure on the coral. And as a result, the coral won't like break in half. So the rubber band is holding it in place, but it's still like a little bit movable down in there. And the coral will attach to the bottom of the hole, but won't uh, come free. And the dude was totally right. Because I went and built a bunch of them, cut up a bunch of coral, gave it a try, and they'll stick right on there. So most of the coral that's in the hallway tank, that's the frag tank, like the shallow tank, the third one over from the classroom, it's mostly soft coral that's been attached to those plugs that I make. And uh, that's relatively successful. And a lot of people don't sell soft coral at the sale that I go to in June that I was talking about. So not to say we have, we've cornered the market, but a lot of people at that sale sell really, really high-end expensive coral, that's stony coral. Things sell for 50 to to $100 a piece. But there's a lot of people young in the hobby who don't want to spend a lot of cash. They want stuff that's different and unique, like soft coral and things that are a little more common. And we sell a lot of that common stuff. So it's kind of funny because everybody who goes to it starts setting up Friday night. They are kind of looking around at everybody else's table. And people always come by criticizing. They're like, well, you got all this stuff for 10 bucks? You're not going to make any money. I'm like, I'm going to do just fine. And then at the end, they're like, what'd you make? And I'll be like, I made eight grand. I sold out of everything. And they're like, what? I only sold five pieces it's because they're trying to sell stuff for a hundred dollars a piece. They bring like a whole bunch of high end stuff and they sell a few pieces and they make high profit on it, but they don't make a whole lot of money, you know? So I get in there and go for quantity, you know, 10 bucks a piece, sell 80 of them or take 800 pieces at 10 bucks a piece, make $8,000. Right. And everybody else is going in like, I paid 75 for this. I'm trying to get a hundred for it. Like they'll buy stuff. They'll buy colonies that are expensive, cut it up ask a whole lot of money and uh, don't end up doing very well. So people get in and out of the hobby a lot. Uh, every business has a different focus. You know how it goes. Like no matter, no matter what you're buying and selling and doing, you can make different money. Ferrari makes a lot of money selling cars, but they don't sell many cars a year. They don't have a very big client base. They're limited. They can't grow as a company. But, you know, if you're Chevy and you're cranking out little cars, you know, you make a couple thousand bucks for every car and you can sell millions of those cars. Now you're making some cash. Now you're like really, you know, nobody's bragging about their Chevrolet Spark car, right? Or like Chevy Malibu. Not like it gets you around and it does the job. But nobody's going to win at a car show with it. But the manufacturer is making a lot of money they're making a lot of uh, high volume. So luckily we have the space, we have the resources, and it just takes time to get this stuff all done. So, uh, and you know, our coral is what it is. And a lot of a lot of young, young people in the hobby and beginners, schools as an educational resource, get a hold of our stuff. 
throw it out. And everything that we've got is aquacultured in captivity. So it's usually good to go. The stuff that people capture out of the ocean, cut it up and offer it for sale. There's a lot of genus and species of coral that are readily available in the ocean and are plentiful, but don't do well in captivity. They just don't survive well in captivity. And uh, as a result, sometimes people get really dissuaded in the hobby because they're like, I went to a sale and I bought 500 bucks in coral and all of it died, but it would be because they're not experienced enough. They don't have the right lighting or water conditions for their coral, or they actually bought coral that was not grown in captivity and did well in captivity, proven to be good in captivity. But our stuff is all like captive, captive grown. So it's kind of a little bit better off. And we're one of few schools in the country that do this kind of thing. So it turns out when I'm at the sale, people are like, hey, you're that school, right? I'm like, yep, I'm that school, right? There's another big school up in Connecticut uh, that has a big coral growing operation. It's fairly well known to you, but uh, in Pennsylvania, we're the, there's other schools that do coral in Pennsylvania and people who sell coral from schools, but not at the kind of volume that we do. So we're like, we're the school in Pennsylvania that does it. Anyway, that's how it goes. So um, in order to get experience doing this, I'll have like tanks with coral set up on the tables for the next couple days. And you literally just break, put on some gloves. And the gloves are good to wear because the coral itself, uh, sometimes it's smelly and you get that smell on your fingers. But coral also produces a protective slime and that slime is actually really, really slimy and kind of gross. Uh, for instance, here, as I just wait a moment, because I pulled this out of the water, it'll make a slime. See how this is dripping here? But then in a bit, the drip will turn into more like, it'll look like booger. I saw it earlier. Yeah, see how it's kind of like more like, like post-nasal drip, like boogery snot looking. and. In a bit, it'll even just be a string that'll just go all the way down to the water. And it's kind of gross and slimy. And it tastes terrible. That's what coral does is like, I'm not going to be eaten, so I'm going to make slime. Not intentionally. No, but like, if you have it on your fingers and you accidentally get it in your eye or your mouth, it's really gross. It actually like kind of soaks into your skin. So you'll smell it on your finger. Even if you wash your hands with soap and water, your fingers will still smell like coral. I don't know, it's not as gooey anymore because I I think it's already slimed out pretty much. But on this one, there's still living tissue on the bottom. It's living tissue from year to year and it's dead from year back. Because even though it sits with the light on the top, light will reflect off a piece below it and it'll get a little bit of light on the bottom. So the coral will grow on the bottom and on the top. So that's how we do it. And it turns out that piece of soft coral I had had a whole bunch of flatworms on it. You might see, see down in that bucket at the bottom is all those little dots. Those are actually worms. They're a flatworm. And those are not good. They're kind of a pest. They can live in and on and around the coral because I kind of like moving the coral around the flatworms fell off. So before I take coral to sell, I isolate it in the tank and then treat it with uh, a dewormer that take, that'll kill all the worms. And then also whenever you buy coral or bring coral to a new aquarium, there can always be pests, especially uh, flatworms. The flatworms are just kind of unsightly. Some flatworms actually eat coral so people do what they call, uh, they'll dip the coral, they'll make a solution that literally has a bare brand uh, insecticide in it. And you dip the coral in, it'll kill any kind of like worms that are parasites. And then you can put the coral in your aquarium, but there's always uh, the risk of getting things in your aquarium that you didn't want. And it's really, really, really hard to eradicate them sometimes. So the dewormer I use is this drug called levamisole. And 
it was readily available. You could just go into Tractor Supply and buy it in packs. And if you can go take it, you work. Like if you have cattle or swine, they get intestinal uh, worms. You put it in their feed and it deworms the swine or the cattle. But then uh, people started cutting coke with it to make crack. And the DEA took Levamisole off the market because people were making crack. They were using it as a cutting agent for his crack. So I went in the tractor supply one time, like, you guys got Levamisole? They're like, no, we don't carry that anymore. What are you trying to do? I'm like, uh, just looking for some. Because instantly, like, anybody who, because people would just go to tractor supply and buy it. You know, like, if you're trying to make uh, crack, you take cocaine and you cut it with, like, you're really cheap baking soda or some other kind of stuff to increase its mass and decrease its potency and make it so it's in a smokable form and people have done different things with different kinds of drugs and sometimes someone was like hey let's try levamisole and it turns out that's actually an excellent cutting agent for coke so but then as a result farmers can't just walk into tractor supply and buy packs of it real cheap to feed to their cattle and pigs they've got to like get a veterinarian to uh, prescribe the more expensive medication and stuff. But luckily, it's not outlawed in Europe, so I buy it on eBay from this dude in France who will mail it to me. So it's all good. That's probably how all the crack dealers do it, too. Because eBay has not banned the sale of Levamisole, and there's people in, in England and France who are like, those Americans, they can't get it. We'll put it on eBay. And eBay's like, whatever. So you go on, you win the auction, PayPal it, ship it to you. <laughs> Like, whatever. So, um, Levamisole. Yeah, like, so your story is Levamisole can kind of cocaine. Like, in cocaine, you just think about Levamisole. Anyway, whatever. Like you can get it, but you have to get a you have to get a prescription for it. This is the way I buy it. These packets. Uh, no. <laughs> Because you don't get dewormed by by smoking it, right? Like, um, so you know, like, cocaine isn't smoked; it's snorted usually. But when you cook cocaine with a cutting agent, like baking soda or something like that, then you make crack, and then it's in a smokable form. But it's also true that dealers can make a lot of money because you actually don't have that much cocaine in with the total mass. So you get what looks like a lot, but it's mostly like something else. Another, yeah, like the cheapest way people do is baking soda. So they'll take a bunch of baking soda, a little bit of cocaine, literally heat it up and cook it, and then sell that, you know, in like a rock form is crack. Yeah. No, baking soda is really cheap, but it turns out it's, like, I don't know everything about, I don't know, I, I don't know. Not only did I not know much about, I don't know anything about like the different forms of the best way to smoke crack, but apparently like baking soda is the like crappiest, worst way, you know, that's just the lowest quality. Uh, that's what I hear. I literally don't know anything about it. Yeah, but so Levamisole has turned out to be like uh, also a choice thing. So it's not available over the counter as easily as it used to be. This is the, like this is the way I get uh, prohibit. Yeah, it's it's just that they don't you used to just walk in a tractor supply and they just had a big box and just grab the packs of it. It was cheap, you know. And then they they were like, that's not going to happen anymore. DEA gets involved. Yeah, so this way, this is like from a antibiotic medication. How this goes is like you can get 
drugs and medication, but then they're going to ask for the prescription. So you have to have a prescribing veterinarian to go along with it. And it used to be cheaper. Like this pack, I mean, I tried to supply with like five bucks for like a little pack. You know, it wasn't much money. Now the cost is much higher. And it's because they have to, this company has to deal with you and getting the, the prescription and stuff. You know, somebody in customer service has to like manually deal with the order make sure that the prescription matches the person that gets sent out to and they've got to probably keep track of who they're mailing it to because if in the end yeah because if in the end you know you're found to use this to make crack they're going to be like well, where did you get it from was the prescription good and stuff this company's going to be liable for you know supply and stuff it's not like Wegmans is going to get in trouble for selling bacon so did somebody but it's the same thing like with Sudafed like people make math out of Sudafed so like if you go to a grocery store, they used to just have Sudafed right there and you can buy as much as you want. Now, sometimes they have it behind the counter or you have to show an ID and there's a limit to how much you can buy in a certain amount of time. And that's because people would like, you know, go into a store and fill up a cart full of Sudafed, go back and make a bunch of math. And uh, you can't do that anymore. I don't know. If you go on Amazon and try to add like 100 packs of Sudafed to your cart, it might say, that's too much for you. I don't know if Amazon cares. eBay cares about a lot of stuff, but they don't, they're not going to know about every item and know if it's sold legally or not. Anyway, the problem with uh, taking a whole bunch of that and dumping it in the aquarium is it turns out that when those flatworms die, they release a toxin into the water that can be toxic to the fish. So you have to be careful about how much and where and when you do it. Because all of our aquariums are interconnected, what I'll do is I'll nuke like one tank at a time. I'll disconnect the tank from the system so the water's not flowing in and out of it, put the levamisole in, let all the flatworms die, try to siphon as many of them out, do a water change in that tank, and then reconnect it to the system so that any toxins from the flatworms in that one tank, yeah, it gets really diluted and minimized. And uh, I might do it this summer, but it'll take many days, kind of like go one tank at a time. Because the other problem is, those flatworms, they get picked up by the pumps and shot around from tank to tank. So you can never you can never totally isolate the tanks entirely. And there's also the flatworms could be in the plumbing, they could be down in the sumps. But what you just can't do is take a whole bunch of that levamisole, dump it in all the tanks, and have huge numbers of flatworms die in a short time because it can be toxic to the fish. So you you can't you can't kill stuff too fast. Most things in the ocean. Many things in the ocean produce toxins. They produce things that keep stuff from eating them. Like the coral at minimum, if it doesn't have calotoxin, it'll at least taste terrible and be slimy and gross. And that really dissuades fish from eating it, you know? Yeah. That's what I'm asking you. 